So for this episode, we're going to be talking about what it means to farm well. We're heading to Newcastle, a small town in Kentucky with a very long farming tradition. I'm always on the farm and Lindsay's usually in her kitchen and so to get us out and inspired by other people is really important. We aim to educate viewers to learn how to cook from real ingredients for their family and friends. And we also want to encourage viewers to access those ingredients from their local farmers. There's these beautiful rural landscapes, there's these tiny little towns, and I'm ready to explore them and I'm ready to see what they're cooking and what's growing in their gardens. So we're headed to Newcastle, Kentucky, which is in Henry County a very rural area of Kentucky. The farming community, along with various organizations and businesses, are all working together to figure out how to make farming viable. First, we're heading to Steve Smith's farm, who has been farming in this area for decades. Steve is a great farmer. He's thinking a lot about farming philosophy. He had one of the first CSAs in Kentucky. So Steve definitely looks at farming from the big picture. So you said you grew up on this farm, yeah, farming. Was it always? you know, cows and um, horses and pigs that you all farmed? Or? Yes, always. We ran a dairy, we milked cows, and we grew tobacco. Belonged to my grandparents, farmed here since I was a boy. And then when they passed away, I bought it in 86. So Steve, I know you said you sort of had to go through a, a renaissance of deciding where to take your farming practices. Do you have a philosophy of farming, would you say, that you developed? I don't know. It was kind of an odyssey, really. You find yourself in an industrial setting if you're in farming pretty soon. So it's been an evolution back to agrarianism and trying to discover uh, my roots, really. That's, that's how you measure this, is your happiness. It was interesting discussing the challenges of farming with Steve. He talked a lot about how you have this product, but maybe you don't have the processor available, or maybe you don't have the market to sell to. And so having all those layers work together is so important, and Steve has that understanding of that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Here we are. Look at those little guys. Hi. Oh, look at these babies. Hello. Hi. <laughs> And they get pasture in the summer. They can run and root, which is pretty important. They spend their life in a group, in a herd, uh, being pigs. <laughs> what they're meant to be. And I think they're happy. There is an army of people willing to support good farming if they know about it. The most important thing is the conversation. To not lose patience, to not go for the easy answer, to not be desperate for a solution, but to realize the importance of having this conversation. What about when it does come time for processing? We are using trackside butcher shop. With uh, trackside and local processing, we can start to change the picture. Walking the land with Steve, we got to hear about what it is he's doing, but also what it is he needs and what his fellow farmers need. And it's not quite as simple as just raising animals and putting them out to market. And so I can see why this processor in Henry County was so important to all these farmers around them. First, the commute for the animals is much shorter, but also you do all this work to raise your animals in the deepest respect, and it can all be ruined in a second. So having a good processor in that community has really allowed the community to have faith in growing these animals and knowing they can have a place to butcher them well so they're able to feed their community well. I decided to visit Trackside Butcher Shop and Processing Facility to learn a little bit more about what it is that they do to bring fresh meat to their community and to help their local farmers. All right, so I can't wait to see all about the operation start to finish. Where do we begin? First of all, I've got you a coat okay. and a hairnet. All right, fantastic. And these all came in yesterday, you said? Yes. Wow, and I see cows and pigs and a little bit of everything. How many, on average, would you say come in a day? Like, uh, all species? About 25. Wow, yeah. 
Steel are obviously serving a need. Fall just tends to naturally be the, the busy, busy time of the year. Our families would, would harvest hogs in the fall. You know, it's just family tradition. But it's interesting, uh, throughout the, the spring and summer, farmers' markets get really busy. So it's a, it's a nice combination. So everything comes from where we just were in the aging cooler into the processing floor. And this is where we break the carcass down. Uh, we cut it up into steaks and roast. And then also we do all the grinding in this room and packaging. And so from here, it'll go into the freezer and then it's ready to go home. So if it's my, you know, cow or hog, do I get to tell you what cuts I want? Yeah, absolutely. And how it's working out. Oh, that's nice. that's the, the great thing about custom processing. We feel very fortunate of how, how supportive this community has been to us. And from day one, people have trusted us to process their animals for them. They put a lot of work into them. A lot of money goes is yeah. invested in that yeah. animal. And, and from day one, they've been dropping those animals off here for us to take care of. Trackside is helping to fill the gap between raising animals and then getting them out to the community. I loved seeing that they had a storefront as well, so locals could pop in and pick out the local meat, whatever it is that they felt like cooking that day. And it's wonderful to see how they can impact the community, not just with the farmers, but providing jobs to other members of their town. We're going to be visiting the Berry Center in Newcastle, Kentucky, where they are taking Wendell Berry's work and putting it to action. Wendell Berry is a farmer, but he's also a writer and has inspired a lot of people to care for the earth, care for this land, and have this respect for farmers. We are a, a land-based economy. Everything we need comes from the land, and so we've got to take care of it. And one of the ways that cultures have taken care of land is by practicing good agriculture. It was really nice to sit down and talk to Mary. Every time I sit down and talk to her, I learn something new and I leave inspired to keep doing the work that I'm doing. She is Wendell Berry's daughter and she has a vision for the future of the Berry Center but also of our farming community. When we were putting in our tobacco crop, in 1982, the first one we raised as adults, an old farmer came and spent every day with us. And I thought he was coming because we were so much fun and I had cooked a good meal <laughs> and so on. But I had to get a lot older before I saw that what he was doing was making himself, his knowledge available to young people who needed help. This is what we need again. The Berry Center's mission is to preserve and pass on traditional farming methods, but also help connect the farmers with the consumers. Sitting down and talking to Mary about the state of agriculture in our community, talking to her about the markets that are available and the challenges that farmers are having is really eye-opening. She always has this fresh perspective, yet it's rooted in this deep understanding of being a farmer. I feel like people want to help farmers and they want to support good farming. How can we help consumers better support farmers? We do have more people aware of what's going on. That is true, but we have not successfully matched up the countryside farming with the urban demand for local well-raised food. What we're trying to work on here is the mechanism that moves product for farmers so farmers don't have to do everything. Yeah, it's a lot of work to get right. everyone to come to you. And right. One of the gaps that has been a serious challenge in a livestock state like Kentucky is how few local processors there have been. So our work with local beef initiative or home place meats really would not be possible if um, trackside was not there. The reason the Berry Center is so important to me is because I know that the work I'm doing day to day isn't tackling that bigger picture. And so the Berry Center is trying to solve these problems that we have in our agriculture systems and in our rural communities in this wholesome, holistic approach. I believe to farm well means that you do no harm, that you are building soil, not losing soil, that it's not toxic. 
that it's not polluting the land, water, and air to leave better um, what you started with. Yeah is farming well. One of the things that we're trying to do here is be the culture that has been done away with. I mean, how can we help young farmers in the way that we ourselves were helped by older farmers when we got started? It was so nice to visit Steve and see his pigs and then see exactly where they're going. And we even got to witness a hog unloading. Yeah. A spotted hog. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. That was really neat. Yeah. I really like that we're taking this from the farm. Literally, mm -hmm. we'll be on our table later today. Mm -hmm. And we got to bring on this beautiful pork shoulder from Steve's farm. And also at Trackside, they um, told us about this rub that yes. they suggested would be quite delicious. So I think we're just going to go low and slow with this. Since Steve and Mary are coming to dinner, I wanted to make sure that his pork shoulder shined even more than it already does. And so we don't mess with it too much. We're gonna use a little bit of the rub that we picked up at Trackside Butcher Shop just to enhance the flavor. But otherwise, the star of the show is the pork. Well, this side, you can really see the color of the yeah. meat. It's really and intense. you can appreciate, I mean, it has a huge fat cap on the top, but you can appreciate that the fat is like all throughout. And we have a bone in here. So we've got the oven on 200. We're gonna put it here in the roasting pan with some apple juice. We're gonna cover it up super tight, and then we're just gonna let it cook all day. So with our pork shoulder, which we're cooking nice and slow, we're going to pair a fun twist on a barbecue sauce, so we're using some sweet potatoes. And then Mary has shared a family recipe for braised cabbage that we're going to put beside the pork. I think it'll be a great complement to it. Told me you had a barbecue sauce where they use sweet potato. Yes, I went to Mary's house for lunch. It was uh -huh. the summer, and she had this delicious sweet potato barbecue sauce. Yeah. And it was supposed to be a way to substitute any sort of artificial sugar with the sweet potato. So today we are going to use some sweet potato that we've just simply roasted the sweet potato, mashed it up here, and then we also picked up some honey, local yes. honey, when we were at Trackside Butcher Shop yesterday. So I think that'll add another nice element of sweetness to some otherwise spicier more intense ingredients. But first, we're going to get our onion, just a quick saute to take the bite of the onion out of it. This is one of my favorite ingredients. They're oh. chipotle in adobo. They're really spicy, but they have this awesome smoky flavor, and I just I just love them. So yeah. that's gonna definitely add depth of flavor to our sauce. Apple cider vinegar to add sort of that tanginess, brightness. If you wanna go ahead and put yeah. the um, tomato paste in there, okay. it'll be tomato-based barbecue sauce, but tomato paste is super intense. So, um, and it's good to work with, you know, when tomatoes aren't in season. Then we're gonna add a little bit of water. Okay. Um, this is about two cups, just to help thin everything out. And we've got a lot of thick ingredients here, particularly. And we wanna get it as smooth as possible, but as it cooks down, it will thicken and reduce, and the flavors will all concentrate. All right, I think that should do it. So we're going to sort of cook it down, reduce yep. it a bit. Yeah, we're just going to let it simmer. All right, so next up is Mary Berry's great-grandmother's cabbage recipe. Oh, wonderful. And I think this is very appropriate with the other items that we're cooking because it's going to cook for a long time, just like the pork. So a slow meal we're having yes. today. It's the winter. This is what yes. we do, right? We take our time. Yeah, it's meant to be a time where you sit around a fire while there's a pot on the oven just like fuming the whole house. Exactly. <laughs> Warming everything and, yeah, fueling our soul. Got a little fat melting in the cast iron, and then it's super simple. We've just got, it's like a sweet and sour cabbage. So we've got some apple cider vinegar here, some sugar, and then a little bit of salt. Mary said when she sent over the recipe that you know it's done when it begins to caramelize on the bottom of the pan, mm, which I love. That's going to so. be perfect. Excellent. 
Excellent. And then if you just want to go ahead and throw in um, the other okay. berry component. So what do we have here? That's apple cider vinegar. Okay. So that's the sour mm -hmm. aspect of the sweet and sour cabbage. And then that's about a half a cup of just regular sugar. Woo, we're not yeah. scared of that sugar. Nope, it is a nice sweet component. <laughs> and then just a little bit of salt. And okay. that's certainly something, you know, we can up the ante on yes. later if necessary. So I'm going to transfer this back to the stove. We'll give it a good stir and then we'll just let it hang out. Perfect. All right. Can't quite think of a better meal for winter than this one. It is a stick to your ribs type of meal, but it's also embracing what we have fresh during the winter. Okay, so we've been patiently waiting and our pork shoulder is ready to go. We've let it rest for a little while. Once it's done, I like to take it out of the roasting pan and then just wrap it nice and tight in a couple layers of tinfoil. The juices have redistributed and we're gonna pull this guy. So there should be some really yummy juice that has fallen wow. to the bottom, so we're gonna Kind of try to reserve yeah. some of that, okay. yeah. And then see how like soft this oh fat my gosh, cap is. Yes. Yeah. So I'm and it's already like falling apart in my fingers, which is a really Perfect. good sign. So I'm gonna give you a couple of forks. Awesome. I've got a couple, and then we are just gonna go to it. So obviously this fat cap has been great for flavor, but not necessarily, you know. And so you can just see how it's just absolutely so soft. Oh my gosh, tender. yes. It's falling apart. It really is, which is is key. So once we get this nice and broken down, we're going to go ahead and add those juices back in okay. um, just to continue to keep it nice and flavorful. And then we will get our um, barbecue sauce we made earlier and we'll toss that in there. Perfect. And we can keep it nice and toasty warm and just a really low oven. I mean, just put it on your lowest setting, just purely there for warmth. And it'll hang out for us until it's time to eat in a little bit. good here. Yes, that's amazing. All right, well if you want to pour those juices just back on top, so that's just yummy flavor that we don't want to get rid of. All right, and then here is our barbecue sauce and it has been just sitting warm on the stove but it cooked down earlier so you can see it's got a nice texture and you can definitely smell oh, all yeah. the spices and stuff in there. So we're going to toss just enough to kind of coat it and then we'll serve the rest on the side. Do you want to try? Yeah. All right. Cheers. Mm. It's perfect. It's so good. It just like melts right in your mouth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. And the sauce is mellow. It's not like too overpowering. I think definitely a little bit more like on the side would be what I would do. And it'll be delicious. And I think the cabbage will be a nice counterpoint. Yes. Yeah, it'll have that, that bite. Soury. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, let's cover this back up. We'll pop it in the oven just really low to stay nice and warm, and then Mary should be here soon and we'll make our pie. Sounds great. All right. As a self-taught home cook, I love learning from others, and especially someone like Mary Berry, who grew up in the farming community and has wonderful knowledge and tradition all her own. We asked Mary to teach us how to cook a pie. Neither Lindsay or I really had that much experience cooking a pie, and I feel like that's one of those experiences you really need to learn from someone else. And so it was nice to have Mary bring one of her traditions into our kitchen. We just made our pork before mm -hmm. you got here. Thank you all so much for the yeah. pork shoulder. Sure. It, we're very excited about it. We hope we did it justice for you. I'm sure you did. <laughs> Can't wait. And now we're excited to learn about your pie. So what are, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm going to sift this flour. We'll make about three pie crusts. Mm -hmm. And I usually make three and freeze two okay. and make one pie. And I'm going to put the egg and the milk and the vinegar, vinegar in. And generally with pie crust, is it always just white vinegar? Or do you ever, would you ever I use always, cider? I use cider. Cider, okay. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it matters. Yeah. So I'm just going to mix it up until it holds together a little okay. bit. And you just use a normal fork for all this? Uh, Normally? Yep. I do. Yeah. And I'm going to cut in the lard. And so if someone didn't have lard on hand but wanted to make this pie crust, could they use cold butter or something like that? Or is lard sure. really the essential um, element here? I'm sure it'll work to use butter. Yeah. Um, in fact, I have made pie crust with butter when I don't have any lard. I just usually keep that a secret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this, this pie was made by a woman named Lois Flood, who was really a practitioner of what um, my father has called the art of the commonplace. Great cook great gardener, uh, wonderful seamstress, 
And so she made, whoop, <laughs> this should be a little more in a lump, but it's all right, I can Need it make there. it. Yeah. So if it comes out really, I think people worry about pie crust too much. Mm -hmm. However it comes out, make it work. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, I know with some crusts and doughs you want to work on, like try not to over knead. Is that a case with this particular type of dough? If you're lucky, you won't have to over knead it. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes if you don't, if the weather is hot, okay. if your kitchen is hot, mm -hmm. and uh, I would recommend if that's the case, then you chill it a little bit. I almost never do. Mm -hmm. But um, if it's too hot, it's a little harder to work with. And then when you have a little trouble with it, you might have to knead it again. Okay. It was such a pleasure learning from Mary how to make her pie. Every recipe generally has a story, and this one was no exception. Mary got to tell us where it came from, who shared this with her, and now she passed it along to us. One of my favorite things about cooking. This is the pie I make for my father every year for his birthday. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He loves he loves pie, especially <laughs> fruit pie. So this is your all-purpose pie crust. You've used this for... I do. Purpose. I use this. I even use this pie crust for hot pies. Well, and I guess, too, there really there isn't any sugar in this crust or anything, so it's a great all-purpose crust. It's not going to have too much sweetness if you did want to use it in a savory application. There's certainly going to be plenty of sugar in the filling, though. Nice sweetness there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, you can do this. Anybody could do this. Yeah. It's easy. Beautiful. So there you go. Right. Yay. We're going to do the filling for the brown sugar pie now. Okay. I'm going to break three eggs into this. I especially like recipes that don't call for so many ingredients that you have to go to several stores to get them. And I'm going to put those. in the sugar. Okay. Mix that around. I see why they call it this. Yes. Yes. Aptly named <laughs> brown yeah. sugar pie. And then the whipping cream or heavy cream. Mm -hmm. Or if you mm. happen to have a Jersey cow, <laughs> that would be the best cream. I mean, could anything be easier? <laughs> no. It's wonderful. Right. It looks suspiciously like pumpkin, but it isn't. So we should <laughs> all take a moment to be grateful. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And then we are going to bake this um, at what's the temperature in time? 425 for 10 minutes and then 20 or so at 350. We'll get this in the oven and Great. we'll gather the rest of our dinner together and it's about time to eat. Good. <laughs> We're starving. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for making dessert. <laughs> You're quite welcome. The pie was super simple. We were using ingredients that we have on hand. It was a recipe that was passed down from farmers, so that was really nice to see Mary teach us a recipe that was so simple yet had this like deep connection to people of the community. It was so wonderful having Steve and Mary over and I'm so grateful they were able to join us for our meal. I have to be honest, it's intimidating to cook for professionals like them that are so experienced in what they do. Steve is the farmer, I hope he thinks I honored his ingredients. And then Mary, again, is just such an icon in the world of farming and what it means to farm well. So does this food taste better knowing you raised this pig? I think so. There's a lot of satisfaction and more satisfaction than just the flavor. Mm -hmm. Just in the knowing something about the animal. What about the vegetables you all have raised? Do you think those taste better? I know those taste better. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have family recipes that have been passed down that remind you of certain people or certain situations? Oh, I suppose so. Yeah, I think certain meals remind you of your growing up. Mm -hmm. Just something we had that we liked and then we grew and you associate that with a good secure feeling. We talked a little about what it was like for us when we were young. I feel like I learned to cook by watching people cook. I like remembering what my mother's hands look like. My mother is alive and making pies, maybe as we speak, <laughs> but I can remember her hands moving. I'm not sure I would hold that memory if I wasn't replicating. You know, we talk about local food, but it's not necessarily happening with this whole movement. It's something we say, but it's not necessarily the reality. But I did find some hope yesterday at Trackside Butcher Shop and all of the good work that they're doing and the service that they're providing in Henry County and how excited they are about it. That's an extremely hopeful story 
Um, we've needed a local processor for, we've been working on this for 30 years. And it doesn't matter how many dollars you throw at something or how many studies or um, whatever it is you do to try to get something a community needs done. You need people who want to do it, who mm -hmm. have the passion for it. And the community aspect, I think, is so important. Not just the having people farm and having people buy the food, but having that community to support you. And I think that's something the Berry Center is doing a phenomenal job, is building that community. I do believe if the local food has done nothing else, it has encouraged a lot of young people from one end of this country to another to think about what they might give their one life to. Having Steve and Mary over and being able to enjoy conversation around a meal with them was really important to Lindsay and I. We're passionate about eating food in season and making sure we know our farmers, but how can we make sure that those farmers have jobs and they have markets and they're able to be good farmers and farm well? How you raise that animal, how you cultivate the vegetables really does matter. So I'm excited for this episode in particular to not just highlight Newcastle and the work that they're doing there, but the philosophy behind it. It's farming and it's part of our history and this episode was important to sort of bring back the simplicity of agriculture yet show that it is this really complex issue that we need to be talking about. 